Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 6G of Useful Genetics. In this lecture, I'm going to briefly describe how SNP typing works. This isn't actually something that you really need to know. I won't ask an exam question on it, but it's very cool, so I thought I should explain it to you. So SNP typing has become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Way back, you had to sequence each DNA fragment separately to find out differences between different individual sequences. Um, but then it was discovered that you could immobilize many DNA fragments on a glass slide, like a microscope slide, sort of, and the prices began to go way down. So when 23andMe first offered SNP typing, they charged $1,000, um, but it went down and down. It's now about $99 to have a million SNPs typed, which I think is an amazing bargain. So here's a photo of a typical DNA typing chip. It's only a few inches long, and this particular one, which is the latest technology, contains 12 compartments, each of which can analyze the DNA from a different person. Each compartment is a microscopic array of tiny beads, um, hundreds of thousands of them in the space of maybe a centimeter squared. And each bead is very tiny. It's only about the size of a bacterial cell, and it's covered with tiny DNA fragments that have been synthesized to correspond to the DNA beside a particular SNP. So the purple DNA here represents the DNA uh, segment of the human genome, and the GC base pair represents a position that's polymorphic. So some people may have CG, and some people may have TA. The DNA fragment that's used for the testing is one strand of DNA that extends just up to the polymorphic position, but it doesn't include it. And it's attached all over the surface of the bead. The array with the beads on it is then incubated with a mixture of genomic DNA strands, fragmented DNA from the person who's being tested. The DNA's been denatured, the strands have been separated. So the strands can then form base pairs with whichever bead they have sequences complementary to. Depending on where the fragment is broken, it may be longer or shorter, and it may pair to the sequence on the bead at different positions. The next slide shows the clever way that the beads are interrogated to ask which version of the sequence that do you have? Do you have the version with the C or do you have the version with the T? So here's a, a blow up of part of a bead being tested with the DNA of a particular person who is homozygous for, in this case, an A allele. And the person's DNA strands have formed base pairs with the DNA sequences on the chip. This is, of course, only a tiny fraction of the person's DNA, just the fraction that matched this position. And this bead is now going to be incubated with a mixture of nucleotides that have been tagged with different colors of fluorescent molecules, so they glow under ultraviolet light different colors, and DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is now going to move across the bead and it's going to, at each position, it's going to try to elongate the synthetic DNA fragment, putting in the base that's complementary to whatever base the person has. So if the person is an A heterozygote, DNA polymerase is going to put fluorescent T's in, tagged with the red dye, at every position. This will make the bead glow red and when the chip is examined, it will be found that that particular position is now fluorescing bright red. If instead the test was done on a person who had genotype AG, their heterozygous, some of their DNA strands would have A's and some would have G's, and DNA polymerase would put in both the T's beside the A's and the C's base paired to the G's. This would result in a bead that had both red and green fluorescence, and the bead would then fluoresce yellow. 
Finally, if the person being tested is homozygous for the G allele, DNA polymerase is going to put in only the fluorescent Cs tagged with green, and that spot on the chip is going to fluoresce green. So simply by scanning the chip with a laser, very high resolution scanning, scoring the color that each spot, each bead fluoresces, the entire chip can be questioned to see which allele is present at every position that the beads are testing. Now, the other issue that comes into play is, well, which, which SNPs are you going to test for? Because these chips don't test every SNP in the genome. Instead, the designer, usually a collaboration between the company that produces the chips, um, recently it's mainly been a company called Illumina, and the company that is buying the chips from them, sometimes individual researchers, sometimes large companies such as 23andMe, um, they will collaborate in designing a chip that has an optimum combination of SNPs. Features that they look for are an even coverage of the genome. So this is a diagram from 23andMe showing the locations of the SNPs that they test for across the genome. And you'll see that most places are very well covered. Um, a few places marked here with the striped marks are not covered. And this is because the sequencing information and the SNP hap map information is not strong enough to give much useful data. They also, in designing the chip, make sure to cover known important SNPs. So things that places where research has taken place, individual SNPs have been characterized, they're included um, even if they're at unusual places, or maybe they don't even qualify really as SNPs because the rare allele is present in less than 1%. But if it's an important difference, they'll try to include it on the chip anyway. Um, they're designed to have high coverage, especially of coding regions and of the sequences that are used for ancestry studies, the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome. We'll talk more about these in a later lecture. And they're designed to have, if possible, coverages of places in the genome where people have what's called structural variants, differences that are caused by insertions and deletions or rearrangements of sequences. So, I've given you a very simplified explanation of the latest SNP typing technology. This technology is extremely accurate. So in general, you don't need to be concerned that the SNP typing results will contain errors in the typing. If the SNP typing says you've got the A and the T allele, you probably have the A and the T allele. The concerns arise instead with the biological significance of the data. How strong is the research evidence supporting a particular association of, for instance, a phenotype with a particular SNP? And how clearly are these results communicated to the customer or patient who wants to use this information? This issue will come up in the next video when we talk about, in particular, the troubles that 23andMe has been having with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So next lecture, we're going to talk about phenotype prediction from SNP analysis. I hope to see you there.